everyone and welcome to my full video conversation with Dr. Stephen Russell. Dr. Russell graduated from Edinburgh University in Scotland with distinctions in surgery and microbiology. He later earned his PhD at University London. He held appointments throughout hospitals in London and Scotland before being asked to join Mayo as their Director of Molecular Medicine. Currently, he heads the Oncolytic Viral Therapy Program at Mayo, which is essentially using viruses as a way to cure cancer. In this conversation, Dr. Russell and I talk about how having an MD and a PhD changes his perspective in doing research. We also talk about some of his input on applying to medical school, and um, as he did so in the past and his son is currently doing it now, he has a bit of a range in terms of perspective in that area. We talk about some of the frustrations that might arise in transferring advancements made in research over in a clinical setting when interacting with patients. I also wondered how, when he's literally working to cure cancer, how he maintains that work-life balance. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Stephen Russell. Trent, I, my um, school education in the UK was, I went to a boarding school in mm -hmm. Scotland, and I was from the south coast of England. And having gone through boarding school, I then went to university in Edinburgh and did medicine. So in the UK, you go straight into med school out of high school, and oh, it's a five-year okay. course. So I did medicine in Edinburgh, and it was actually while I was at medical school that I decided I wanted to work with viruses, which has become my life um, oh. goal, if you like, yeah. to use viruses as a cancer therapy. And the, the story behind that was that I was, I think, a third-year medical student and I just completed my microbiology final exam and I'd been invited back for a distinction oral. There were four people out of the year of 150 got invited back and, uh, and I had a phone call um, before the distinction oral to tell me my sister had died in a house fire and so I went home to the funeral and while I was traveling I was reading the microbiology, I was reading about viruses mm -hmm because I needed something to, I mean it was so awful, just needed something mm -hmm. to take my mind off it. And it was then that I decided this is nature's last untapped bioresource and we can use these as a cancer therapy. And so basically I, I kind of just resolved at that time that's what I would do with my career. So my career ever since then has been all about viruses mm -hmm. for cancer therapy. So anyway, I got through medical school and, um, and I found it, I had very good grades from medical school and then I found it hard to get a job. And um, you know, you have to do similar to internship here, you, it's called, mm -hmm. um, it's similar to the, the residency here. Um, it's, uh, you have to do this one or two years of completing your training actually oh, okay. on the job. And so, I, and they, we call them house jobs. So I applied for house jobs and I didn't get invited. I got invited for interview for all of them and then I didn't get a job. So after about the 10th interview, I um, said to my wife, I don't know what's happening. And she said, well, run through for me what goes on interview. So I said to her, well, you know, I go into the room. Uh, it's all very nice and friendly. We smile, mm -hmm. we shake hands, I sit down. And then they ask me, what would you um, like to do with your life? What's your career ambition? I told mm -hmm. them I want to cure cancer with viruses. And then I said very quickly, it sort of dries up and then they send me out of the room after five or 10 minutes. And everybody else seems to stay in there for half an hour for the interview. <laughs> yeah. So she said to me, okay, lesson number one about job interviews is that you have to express some level of interest in the job that you've applied to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was fantastic advice. So next yeah. job interview I went to, I said, yeah, I want to be a surgeon and I got a job. And so anyway, I learned. But then I, um, then I, you know, obviously wanting to use viruses, having been through medical school, there's no real kind of ability to engineer or manipulate or mm -hmm. do research studies on viruses. So I, I then applied later on. I, I decided to train as a hematologist. I moved down to London, and after I'd completed some high-level training in hematology, I, um, I applied to do a PhD. Mm -hmm. And I actually went to some research labs at the Marsden Hospital in London. 
it was the only lab at the time where there was anyone in the UK working on engineering viruses mm. and using them for gene delivery. So that's when I kind of really got into the actual science. And I, I did my PhD in London. I had a, my supervisor was Mary Collins, who mm -hmm. is, she's a brilliant uh, immunologist. And she's a PhD, not an MD. Okay. So I, it was very interesting. My first day in the lab, you know, I arrived there from, uh, <laughs> I arrived there from my uh, registrar job, where as a very <laughs> important kind of, you know, mid-grade hematologist at yeah. University College Hospital, and I came into this research lab wearing a jacket and tie, and um, and Mary Collins came to the lab and she looked at me and she said. <laughs> take that tie off and don't ever let me see you wear a tie <laughs> oh, in my laboratory again. Wow. And uh, so I, I kind of learned that there was a slightly different dress code going on yeah. between science and research. And, mm -hmm. and the other thing I learned was that I was now um, in a completely different role. You know, I didn't know how to do anything. You know, I had to learn my way all around the kind of practical side of yeah. um, molecular biology and cloning DNA and sequencing and so on. Is that exciting for you or is that kind of scary to be thrown in such a new situation? It was scary and draining and I was not, yeah. te I was not technically good. Yeah. Um, I was, my mind was always away somewhere else so I, you know I'd be doing my lab experiment and pipetting and you know there'd maybe be you know a, a bunch of tubes and a bunch of solutions that needed to go in and I get halfway through and think did I actually already put no. that solution? Yeah. And I, I could. You really need focus. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I have a, I have a great respect for people who are technically skilled in the lab. I mean, I, I really learned to understand yeah. the value of that because I don't really have that myself. You know, I can mm. ultimately get there, but it takes me a lot longer than it does for somebody who's mm -hmm. who's able to completely focus their mind on what they're doing now and push everything else out and then you know come back to the kind of theory and the thinking and the dream and the later rather than while they're actually doing the experiment. So I, um, yeah, I did struggle with my PhD but then um, when I was in my last year of PhD I was very fortunate because my supervisor Mary Collins was busy and she just decided to hire a new technician and she said to me if you um, agree to train this technician, then this technician can work with you on your project. Mm -hmm. And so I got a really good person working with me for that last year of my PhD. And so, you know, I can design experiments and I can interpret data, and but I'm not so great at the execution. And w whereas now I had a, a, a technical support person who would just say to me, look, you don't like the result, the experiment was technically accurate. Yeah. And so yeah. you can trust that result. Your mm -hmm. experimental design just didn't lead to the mm -hmm. result you expected. And, and that, I think, is enormously empowering because I think the most important discoveries in science are the unexpected results. You know, and if you if you are technically skilled and you get an unexpected result and you're confident with what you've done, then you can really move on and you can you can start thinking about well why you know why was it different and and where do we go next yeah. rather than thinking well what did I do wrong yeah and how can yeah. I so so mm -hmm. it's a very important distinction and it was it was a huge transition a for me. Yeah. so anyway, I I completed my PhD and then. I wanted to um, spread my wings at that point, you know, and start um, building viruses to use for cancer therapy that could replicate. I, during my PhD, I had built viruses that were not able to replicate, and they could transfer genes into cancer mm -hmm. cells. And, and we were able to show that by doing this, you could make the cancer cells more easily recognizable by the immune system. So it was a sort of immune therapy, it was mm -hmm. changing cancer cells so the immune system would, would destroy them. And, um, and it worked very well and you know I got my thesis, but then I wanted to make viruses that could yeah. come in and replicate the spread. And I 
could not find anyone in the UK willing to accommodate that. You know, I was still pretty junior, really, by their yeah. standards. I was just finished my postdoc. Yeah. I was still a junior doctor, and anyway, eventually, I I um, landed a job in Cambridge at um, the newly created Centre for Protein Engineering with uh, Greg Winter, who was very famous for antibody engineering. He had. Um, he had worked with Cesar Milstein, who got a Nobel Prize for discovering monoclonal antibodies, and then he he developed technology for um, a humanizing antibodies, taking mouse antibodies and reveneering their surface so they now wouldn't be recognized by the immune system. But also, he developed something called phage display, mm -hmm. which is where uh, antibodies can be. Um, uh, displayed on the surface of a virus that infects bacteria, a phage, and not just one antibody can be displayed there, but you can create a whole library of antibodies. So you can have oh, a million okay. different phages, each one with a different antibody on the surface, and then you can use that library to select the antibodies yeah. that have the desired property. Yeah. So I worked on phage display for quite a while and developed some uh, new approaches for selecting phages from these phage antibody libraries. And in parallel with that, I was able to start displaying antibodies on these replicating viruses that I wanted mm -hmm. to use for um, cancer therapy. And so that was great. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I really, Cambridge was wonderful. And, and there I completed also my clinical training. I became okay. a consultant hematologist. So I was running the two in parallel. And I was worrying about dress code, so on my clinical days, <laughs> wore a tie, on my lab days, not. And I used yeah. to dread the idea that on a lab day I'd be called over to the clinic and you know, so I keep a jacket and a tie somewhere. Oh there. my gosh. But yeah, you had to be really careful about the dress code. People didn't really want to talk to you if you were in the wrong camp. And, um, and then, so, so ultimately, it looked like. Um, I probably had a long-term future in Cambridge, mm -hmm. and I was moving closer and closer to this dream of viruses that can replicate and, and taking them into clinical testing. And I had a call from Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. This was in 1997, I think they called me. And what had been going on here at Mayo Clinic was that at that time, 1997, gene therapy was in the news mm -hmm. because the earliest gene therapy trials were being done here in the US and publicity from that was was really at a high and patients were looking and expecting from Mayo some gene therapy activity and there mm -hmm. wasn't really any going on here so Mayo had decided right we need to we need to launch a gene therapy program and so they, um, they put together um, a package which essentially involved a lot of funding, um, seven faculty positions to fill, uh, the entire 18th floor of the Guggenheim building, which was mm. shell space then, so 10,000 square feet of lab space and a lot of offices. And they went out and started looking for somebody to run the program. And they had a two and a half year negotiation with some very senior scientists here in the US who eventually decided not to come. And then they moved on and they had a, a nine month negotiation with another senior scientist who eventually decided to go somewhere else. And so at that point there was some consternation here at Mayo because mm -hmm. everything had been put together mm -hmm. The benefactors who'd made the donations were saying, well, you know, what, what's actually <laughs> happening yeah. here? And so they, they talked to uh, Malcolm Brenner, who was actually the, the most recent person to, to not come. He'd gone to Baylor College of Medicine, to the Shell Gene Therapy Center, where there, there was an awful lot of oil money coming into mm -hmm. to that center. And he, bless his heart, suggested me as one of three names, and I was still very junior, really, yeah. um, for that scale of opportunity. So anyway, Mayo called me, and I was sitting in my lab, and yeah. the phone call was um, 
the head of the search committee here at Mayo explained to me the opportunity and I thought they're going to offer me one of the faculty positions. <laughs> and they said, and we're looking for someone to run it. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I thought they got the wrong person. <laughs> and then I, I, um, I thought about it over the weekend. And I thought, actually, you know, this is right opportunity, right time. Because yeah. I, knew, I knew all the people who were, you know, just ready to take on their, their senior position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was sort of down there amongst the people who were all going to be the next generation or the next wave. And, um, and so eventually, um, you know, it was agreed that I would come here and it's been fantastic. So, you know, we were, we were able to build here a, a phenomenal program. And it was an opportunity really to breathe life into the stream of oncolytic virotherapy. And we are actually, uh, you know, now we are probably the strongest oncolytic virotherapy group in the world in terms of, you know, breadth and depth and translational capability. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of groups here working on different viruses, engineering them in different ways to be specifically destructive to cancer. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, in, in the same way that... Um, Hepatitis viruses damage the liver, HIV damages the immune system, flu viruses damage the lung. You know, we're creating viruses that specifically damage the cancer. And, you know, looking to specifically maybe a bit strong, you know, we try to make them specific, but mm -hmm. what we end up doing typically is making them highly selective. Okay. So that there, you know, there's always, if you give too much, there's a danger of harming normal tissue, yeah. but you, um, you nevertheless, and, and uh, uh, we strive for specificity, so an awful mm -hmm. lot of what we do is targeting and, and trying to make the viruses specific. But we've, we've got a lot of different labs working on different aspects of oncolytic virotherapy here. And we have taken the leading viruses that have been developed here all the way through to clinical testing, because mm -hmm. this is a perfect environment for that. Mm -hmm. You know, honestly, I've never been anywhere before where you can go and talk to a clinician who is taking care of patients with any type of cancer and number one they're very keen to sit down and talk with you and number two they're very enthusiastic about working with you to test the new agents in the clinic. I mean in Cambridge it was very different because the clinicians that you spoke to would say look I'm just too busy and there wasn't this, it, so Mayo's very much got this three shield culture where everybody who works here is expected to have some involvement in practice, educa education and research. Okay. And so, it, the, so it's, it's almost a no-brainer for a clinician mm -hmm. to think, yeah, I'd love to do that, you know, let's connect, let's do something. And so that's been wonderful. And then, you know, we had, we built a manufacturing facility in conjunction with this program. So we can actually make, um, we call it GMP, good manufacturing practice. We, we can make GMP grade virus, you know, giving virus to a mouse, you just need to make a small amount in the lab mm -hmm. in order to treat a mouse with cancer. But a human is 3,000 times the weight of a mouse. And yeah. so the scale of manufacturers is, is enormously different but also the regulations on that product and the quality mm -hmm. testing of that product to ensure complete safety for the patients when you administer it is yeah. it's a very different thing. So we have a manufacturing facility and then we have a group here that runs the toxicology testing and pharmacology testing. So FDA have a very interesting perspective on data that you show them that most people don't know about yeah. and that's that if if we take, if we do an experiment in the laboratory and we get a result and we show it to FDA, they're disbelieving unless we can show them that the individual who did the experiment was trained to do it. And we've got mm. documentation of that with training records. And that the instruments that we used were properly quality tested and that you can trust the results coming off the instruments because you've got the, bat, the, the, the records for um, all, the, all the testing mm -hmm. that's been done on the instruments and um, 
There are a number of other aspects, but I, I suppose the best way to um, put it is that if we go to FDA and say the hemoglobin in this animal uh, on day three post-virus administration was 10, they say, right, show us that the animal did actually get the test article. Where's that documented? Who was wow. observing the individual give it? Um, was the animal actually um, bled by somebody skilled? in that procedure mm -hmm. and was the blood then processed by somebody who was skilled in that procedure and was the instrument that was used to determine the blood value actually quality so you yeah. can't just say hemoglobin 10 you have to say hemoglobin 10 and here's a ream of paper to yeah, prove that's a, that that that's hemoglobin really was 10. Yeah. So, wow. um, so that's called GLP, good laboratory practice and so we have a toxicology group that does that mm -hmm. So if we, if we decide that we have a virus that's ready to go through to clinical testing, then we can do that uh, FDA compliant, we call it, um, mm -hmm. work to uh, satisfy FDA that, yeah, this is a reasonable um, pathway to, to take and to advance something to clinical testing. And then the other thing we have that's a great advantage to that clinical translation is we're at Mayo Clinic, and so there are many... Um, uh, benefactors here. There are people who just, um, you know, they're high net worth individuals who are patients of Mayo Clinic who um, want to give something to the clinic to advance medicine. And so clinical trials are pretty expensive to do, and especially this kind of translational study where you have to manufacture, do all the safety testing, and then perform the trial. Yeah, yeah. And it's very hard to get NIH grant funding to do that. So being at a center where there's an alternative pathway to, to um, access the financing for that is really important. So we've been able to do a lot. You know, we've taken yeah. viruses through to clinical testing. And by doing that, it, it kind of it makes everything else more vibrant. You know, it's so much more exciting to work in a lab on a... Mm -hmm. A, a virus engineering pro project when you know that the pathway exists for that to go all the way through to clinical yeah. testing if it's successful. So. Yeah. It's, it's painful when um, you have a patient who needs something and you don't have anything mm -hmm. and maybe it um, it increases the frustration if you're actually running a research program that has the potential down the road to help them um, mm. makes you want to accelerate things um, yeah and you can't accelerate them beyond a certain speed you know it really does take a long time to go through the yeah. FDA approval process I think it's probably a minimum of three years from the point at which you show something is really worth translating from your efficacy studies in animal models. Um, if your foot is hard on the accelerator, you know, to get all the tox studies and the manufacturing done and the clinical trial developed and get the FDA approval, minimum three years. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's... Um, it's frustrating in that regard, but it's also motivating in that regard. Mm. Probably more frustrating is when you do actually have something in clinical testing and you have a patient who's not eligible for the clinical oh. study because you always have eligibility criteria. Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah. And, um, you know, somebody has a platelet count that is too low or liver function tests that are... Um, too abnormal, then they're not going to be eligible for the study. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that can be quite frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if it's a patient of mine who's been asking yeah. me every clinic visit for the past, you mm -hmm. know, six years, how's the virotherapy research going, mm -hmm. you know? So. Yeah. I will, how does... How does having an MD play into that for you? Do you think you're more apt to make those connections and think of the human impact, or is that just something you've been inclined to do because of your research? 
I think having the MD for me is, you know, it puts me in touch with the problem that I'm trying to address. I don't think it uniquely motivates me relative to other people. Okay. You know, I think everybody, whether they're an MD or a PhD, has a motivation um, to do what they do. And I would say, you know, pretty much everybody working in our lab has their reasons for why they are committed and motivated to do oncology therapy research. And they all want it to make a difference. So, um, you know, the perspective is an important part of my motivation, but it's not a necessary part of a person's motivation. The most difficult thing about MD um, and PhD is not the dress code, but is the, um, and actually dress code's no problem here. I was right? going to say, is it, yeah, No, this Mayo. is so <laughs> completely different from Cambridge, because it, it is, you know, Mayo is a, is a giant clinic with a research program tagged on to it and you know Cambridge it was very different I was in the laboratory for molecular biology which yeah. is a bastion of fundamental scientific research yeah. and the clinic there is relatively small okay and so it's yeah. the other Emphasis way around is the boot yeah. is on the other foot um, but yeah the most difficult thing about transitioning between roles really came home to me when I was in Cambridge and I was working in my research lab running my research and in research, you absolutely have to have this ability to question whatever you've decided and to reverse mm -hmm. decisions and to completely change your approach. You know, to turn on a dime almost, you know, when you wake up with a new thought or a new understanding or when you see an experimental result. In medicine, and, and, so, and you take time over decisions. You know, you don't make snappy decisions about, okay, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing the other. You, you, you consider. So then, in Cambridge, I, as a consultant in hematology, I had to do, um, uh, th there was a, a transplant service and an inpatient service, and I would, for a, uh, a couple of weeks every now and then, I would have to be the attending physician. And so I would go up to the ward and I would there would be a ward round daily. So there'd be an entourage of maybe 10 people, you know, various different nurses and junior doctors and um, physiotherapists and so on, who would um, come around and there'd be a trolley with all the patient's notes in them and we'd go room by room through the patients on the ward. And the expectation was that this rounding process would take at maximum two hours and at the bedside the patient's history or outside the room the patient's history would be read out to me all the relevant information would be fed in and I as the attending was expected to make a decision wow. about what to do next and that's yeah. just standard you yeah. know that's the way medicine works yeah so the last thing that any of these people wanted was, well, you know, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. Let's think about it. What does everybody think? <laughs> um, and they just wanted to get on with it, decision. right? Yeah. Snappy mm -hmm. decisions. And so you, you, it, it's, it's definitely the case in medicine that you have to be decisive. And you have to be decisive without full command of the facts, without having mm -hmm. had the opportunity to think through, you know, a million scenarios. And so it's much more of a spinal reflex, you know, based on experience type of approach. And then what you cannot do is come back in the next morning. You say, you know, that decision we made yesterday. Let's let's uh, yeah. let's take another look at it and reverse it. Mm -hmm. You just can't do that. So you got you're going between certainty and uncertainty. Has to be your modus operandi. Mm -hmm. And it's it that I think is quite hard. Yeah. Um, how have I gotten around that? Well, here at Mayo Clinic, my clinical practice is very narrow. So I'm in a group called the Myeloma Amyloidosis and Dysproteinemia mm -hmm. Disease Oriented Group. So it's MAD, Mad Dog Disease Oriented Group. So we're the Mad Dog Group. But they have many disease oriented groups at Mayo. So we, we only deal with, with patients who have myeloma, amyloidosis, and okay. dysproteinemias. And I'm one of a group of about 20 physicians here who are exclusively taking care of patients with that group of conditions. 
So we meet every Friday morning, every Thursday lunchtime. We talk through um, what we think the appropriate approaches to therapy are, mm. what we think of the new papers that have come through. So I can give patients very good value in that domain because I really am very, very on top of the, the whole field by virtue of it being narrow and by virtue of being part of this group. And also, I can always call any one of my colleagues and talk to them oh, okay. uh, about you know, anything that's uncertain or difficult yeah. or, or needs additional input. So it's, I think it would be much more difficult to do research and be a kind of general physician mm -hmm. or general surgeon or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think that's an important point. Um, and Mayo Clinic does provide you with that ability to be mm -hmm. focused, um, yeah. both on your research and on your clinical practice. And I'm interested in how you begin to define a scientific venture with all of those dimensions in mind as a success. So what if a patient doesn't necessarily respond positively to a treatment, but you make an incredible advancement. So I know you had a patient that responded not fully to a treatment, but you got really good pictures or images out of it. I'm, of course, ignorant in terms of the science, but how do you balance that to say, okay, this was a productive or successful venture? Well, I don't call that success. Yeah. I mean, success is... Um Success is when the treatment actually benefits the patient. The patient. Um, you know, everything else is um, it's important information. And, you know, we absolutely have to take note of it and, and use it to guide how we develop our approach, um, you know, what directions we take. I mean, it's a constant feedback into the machine to try and perfect the therapy and the way the therapy is administered. But to me, it's just not a success to see beautiful images. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's just important information. Mm -hmm. And it may validate one approach or another approach that we're using, but I, I'm sort of you know, fixated on this end goal. Of, of clinical response. I mean, I've had one success in my life. Yeah. And that was a patient who had a spectacular response, um, Stacey Oholtz, who's still doing extraordinarily well. And that, um, that means the world to me. And, um, and I, you know, like, well, I would love to make that a, a recurrent yeah. kind of theme with patients who come mm -hmm. in. Um, she, um, every time I speak to her by phone or when I see her in the clinic, reminds me of that. I mean, she's very anxious herself to see mm -hmm. it, you know, disseminated. Yeah. And, and that's the challenge, you know. And I, so, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm miserable about anything that falls short of a, you know, home run cure. Mm -hmm. But honestly, that for me, that's where my success, success. barrier is. Yeah that I'm not going to really declare success until that point. I'm going to be pleased with data, excited about data, um, you know, uh, excited to publish things, etc., etc. Um, but, yeah, success is, is like it's a, it's a life goal thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. we actually it's very long term. Yeah. I'm interested in how you don't get discouraged with the process then. How do you find that you keep yourself motivated? Has this just been like a part of your personality um, or does it something develop throughout your career? Well that's interesting actually because um, I think your, your motivations and, and drivers change with time. Um, I think it's probably a general thing and it's not just me but you know you start out I mean, when I first decided that it was going to be oncolytic viral therapy that I was going to pursue as a life career, it was something that um, people would applaud. And it was something that I knew was a good thing to do. And, you know, mm -hmm. there, were, there were all the right sort of um, motivations mm -hmm. there that you would expect to see in a, in a young, you know, fresh out of 
um, medical school person. As I got deeper and deeper into it um, and become more familiar and more knowledgeable and um, and more skilled in deciding, you know, where the um, where the process should next go. It the motivation becomes different. It's a sort of addictive game. Mm. It's like a crossword puzzle that you're mm. halfway through. You know, you, you don't you don't keep doing it because it's going to save the world or because it's going to be a great thing to do. You keep doing it because you're good at it. Yeah. I mean, that's what you do. Yeah. And there's a there's a satisfaction in in the process. And so I think that has become like my day-to-day -day driver mm -hmm. is is probably more that now. It's just like it's in front of me and and and, and I'm immersed in it and I'm yeah. that's what I do. Yeah. And I enjoy doing it very much. Well, I would imagine so. that's what you need to do because you need the, the shorter term satisfaction. If, you know, achieve, achieving success in your definition is so difficult yeah. or so long term, that'd be yeah. impossible to drive yourself with, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it, it yeah. has, you know, it sort of, it becomes the game you play. And I, and I think that's probably true of mm -hmm. a lot of things for a lot of people. So. Mm -hmm. How do you find, you might laugh at this question too, but I'm interested in what you think of finding balance in your life when you're literally working to cure cancer. How do you take time off of work? Or how do you turn off your brain? Or is that an impossibility for you? I don't think I consciously turn it off or okay. on. Um, you know, it roves. But you, the the... I have not um, badly neglected my personal sort yeah. of family life. I yeah. mean, I you know, I have had a wonderful um, family life. I have four children who are all now fully grown. Um, I just, you know, I couldn't have asked for more out of life, really. Doing doing the work that I love to do and. Um, I'm raising a family here, and you know, Rochester is a wonderful place mm -hmm. to raise a family. I've just been very blessed, and um, you know, my wife and I have both really enjoyed it here mm -hmm. very much. So, and you know, we've—it's not like we've skipped family vacations, and you know, we go skiing, we've been on yeah. road trips, we've sort of done the family thing. I may sit in the car reading a book or thinking about something else, but you know, I'm I'm kind of in and out of yeah. yeah. So and the family are perfectly okay with me being yeah what I am. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's no, that's really admirable. Do you think that that developed throughout your career here? Like when you were first establishing yourself, did you feel a pressure to be putting in really long hours all the time, or has that always just been sort of constant for you having the work life balance? Uh, I've never felt pressure to put in hours. I've always mm. felt as privileged to do what you want to do. And I'm the driver of this. I mean, nobody is telling me to do it. Yeah. It's yeah. not... It, it, that's one of the wonderful things about science, is that you do kind of have the opportunity to do what you want to do at work. And there are very few jobs that, that give you that ability. You know, to decide what the question is, what the approach is, mm -hmm. and uh, how you're going to approach it, and um, and I guess I've been fortunate in that I've always been able to raise the funds to do the things that I like to do. Um, I always tell young scientists and my PhD students, you know, that you have to kind of hold to your um, your path. If you if you've come into science because of that, then the danger is that you get so far down the road and you discover you can't get grant support to do what you want to do. And so people just start chasing the money. You know, there are um, pots of money put in in various places to attract people into specific areas oh, of research. Yeah. And so you know, I do see quite often people kind of changing direction because there's institutional pressure to have research funding. 
and then there's the um, availability of research funding for specific things and you know that's obviously you know there comes a point in life where you have to be pragmatic about you know your ability to raise money to do what you want to do versus what's available I always encourage people if they're going to do academic research if they're going to because it's the pay is relatively low if you're a, a, a you know a PhD scientist in academia versus what it could be in industry oh, so okay. if you stay in academia I think you've got to try and stick with your dream of yeah. what you like to do and and so I encourage people to do that you know that there are people who don't care who just love doing science and they'll do whatever mm -hmm. and, and then you know for them it's often a good thing to move into industry because you know they may be shifted project to project to project but will be quite happy with that yeah, so doing. yeah so it's it's kind of I mean different people have different drivers yeah we talked about your scientific definition of a success. Do you think that you have a differing personal definition of success in your own life? Is it really like inextricably tied to your work, or is it different? No, I, I don't think that I can really say I have some specific goal there. I mean, I, you, you know, I. Having a goal in my career of cure cancer with viruses is it's made all my career decisions very easy because you know there is the goal and I can easily look at an opportunity and does it bring me closer or does it take me further away and you know big administrative positions that um, you know I might consider applying for well why would I because that will just pull me in the wrong direction and so um, so it's made it easy in terms of career choice but in in the personal family life you know there hasn't been some big looming goal to pursue mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it would be if there were yeah, but it's, yeah. it's just happened and it's been yeah it's been delightful yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's fantastic I don't think there has to be you know it's yeah. just um, it's really interesting for me to see people who are really invested in their work and see how if they have sort of a, a line between how they define success and how they define success in their work because I think it's it's hard to separate those things mm. sometimes but um, I didn't, I mean, the time when work-life balance was tough was as a junior doctor in the UK because there, mm -hmm. you know, we had these um, very long shifts uh, because the, the, um, the junior doctors, the residents, had to share the, they do a 40-hour week officially and then the, remainders, the uh, remaining hours of the week they would share between them either on a one in two so you'd split them 50-50 or a one in three, depending on how many residents there were on the unit. And a one in two was very tough. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you would, for, for a one in two, you'd come in Friday morning, if it was your weekend on, and you'd go home Monday evening. And for that period of time, oh, you were the yeah. resident for, um, you were the first person to call for, patients being admitted to the mm. hospital who needed to be clocked in and um, you know set up with their medications who needed IVs inserted and so on you would be That's the cool. first on call for the ICU yeah. to resuscitate patients who had cardiac arrest etc and it, my worst ever weekend I think I got two hours of sleep between Friday morning and Monday yeah. evening and you know, we, we used to have dinner parties for the residents, you know, we'd all get together and people would be falling asleep <laughs> at the dinner table. Oh my but that was yeah, tough yeah. because it, it was a bit too much. But a having too much. Well, having yeah. said that, you know, it was oh, it, and it yeah. doesn't happen anymore. But having said that, when you look back on it, it was priceless experience. Mm. Because when when a patient comes into hospital with whatever. I mean there were sort of standard emergency admissions that would come in of a Friday, Saturday, Sunday evening, you know, they'd be a, acute worsening of chronic bronchitis, you know, someone with chronic bronchitis would get a chest infection. It would be attempted suicide um, through overdosing, so you know, especially on Friday and Saturday oh, okay. uh, nights. Yeah. 
it would be the acute asthmatic attack, the heart attack, the you know, there were some standard things, there were probably, you know, twelve or so problems that people would come in with and, and that you you'd you'd yeah. have to deal with. So you got um, you got pretty familiar dealing with it. But each patient who came in, you would then follow through the course of their hospital admission, and you'd oh, be the only okay. person there for them. You'd keep coming back to that same patient, mm -hmm. and you would see everything develop as opposed to coming in, doing eight hours, and then leaving, and somebody else takes over, mm -hmm. and when you come back, you know, that patient's done and has left the hospital. Um, so, mm -hmm. so this way you got a really, you know, start to finish, okay, you know, I'm caring for you, I see how things develop, I see, you know, all the issues that arise during that time. So it was a phenomenal learning experience, and unmatchable, I think. Yeah. And, and it, we, you know, it was at some level a disservice to the patients because they were dealing with very sleepy Doctors, and, you I, know, I, I, I never you. did it. Yeah. I never did it, but I've had colleagues who, who just fell asleep at the patient, oh. but, you know, <laughs> taking a history and then kind of oh fell asleep. And the yeah. patient says, oh, I, I didn't like to wake you up. <laughs> so you look so... <laughs> I don't want to disturb you. How do you do your job in that little sleep? That's all I have. I, like, yeah, I it's hard. You function. It's hard. It's hard. But you, you well, way, you, you kind of find a way. Yeah. And, um, oh. Yeah. But you do get a bit irritable, you know. No. You get to your bed and then five minutes later, and you desperate to sleep, and then five minutes yeah. later the pager goes off and you have to get up again. Oh my god. So, and you learn to really get along um, well with your nursing colleagues mm. because they could make your life hell if they wanted <laughs> to. I mean, because they, they yeah. can call the doctor for so many trivial things that happen on the ward. Mm. You know, like somebody's temperature went up um, just a teeny bit or you know somebody's uncomfortable needs a prescription of Tylenol or something mm -hmm. and it's not written on the chart so you know we the nurses can't give it you have to come mm -hmm. down and write it up and so they were that but whereas if you got along well with them they'd say mm -hmm. um, they just write it out and say, just sign it in the morning. And yeah. <laughs> so I can imagine that'd yeah. be a lot of help if you're yeah. going on two hours. So, yeah. so if you were a jerk, you yeah. paid a price for being a jerk. Yeah. yeah basically. I'm interested in your input on or advice for students who are interested in entering med school. Um, do you think that? Do you find that there's like a wrong motivation for entering? Med school? Do you find students who do it just for the like the title, or you know, is there like is there things that you'd be wary of? Do you think or? Hmm. Well, I didn't have the right motivation for medical school, oh, okay. according to current selection um, process. I mean, I was at school. I was good at science, and actually, I I, I was. I loved learning, and so you know, I my grades were kind of good across the board. But it was science that I enjoyed most, and so looking at what career in science would make most sense, yeah. it was medicine. So I wasn't driven by a, the sort of motivations that people need to declare now in order to get into medical school, and not just need to declare but need to prove. And I was accepted into medical school based on an application without an interview. And that was oh, actually wow. fairly common at that the time. It was, okay. It was simply, yeah. you know, tough curriculum. We need people with yeah. high grades who, um, who can actually assimilate knowledge um, mm -hmm. fast and efficient. And so this, I think the pressure on places has increased. So now you, you still have to have those high grades and you have to be capable of, of doing all the learning, but now you also have to prove, and, it, and it's, it's also in the UK, mm -hmm. so I don't think this is unique to the US, but you also have to prove that you really want to do it for all the right reasons. Yeah. And you know those right reasons are all to do with the, um, the sort of idealistic um, motivations that I talked about for why I decided I wanted to cure cancer with viruses. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure about it. I, I, I think, you know, as soon as you set the, um, you set the rules of engagement, then people 
very rapidly get to understand those rules of engagement and, they, okay. and, then, and then they play to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sense. sure that, yeah. I, I, I think the people who can sell that message best are, are get put at an advantage. Mm -hmm. The people who really say, okay, what are they looking for? How do I then project myself as having that? What experiences do I need to get on my CV in order to prove that I'm right for medical school? And so, because it's very, it's very game. difficult yeah. at an interview to actually know a person's mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it's impossible to know their mind also from their, their, um, you know, their personal yeah, statements, etc. So, um, so, I don't know that we necessarily choose the right people. I know that there are a lot of applicants relative to the number of places. Mm -hmm. And I'm just not sure that there's a perfect way ever to, choose. to do That's this kind of competitive thing. Yeah. I, I also know that a lot of medical students now entering medical school in the U.S. have taken time out between college and medical school either because they had to, because their first application was unsuccessful, or because they chose to. And uh, certainly in Mayo Medical School, you know, most of the students now have had between two and eight years doing something else after wow. college okay. before they come to med school. Yeah. So it's, um, and, I, and I worry about that too, because, you know, as I said to you earlier, you know, I came straight from high school to med school. And, and so graduated from medical school age 23 and started practicing medicine at that point. And now we, here in the US, you have to go through your undergrad. So you've got mm -hmm. four years, that takes you out to 22. And then if you go straight to medical school, you're out to, to 26. Mm -hmm. If you take those years out, then, you know, you can, people are, are pushing 30 when they graduate or beyond 30. And so it shortens that career time mm. when you're actively practicing it greatly increases the amount of debt you have at the time of entry into um, into oh, the workforce okay. and I think that's a huge albatross around the neck of so many medical students who go through um, I don't know I just worry about it yeah. and then there's this then there's this increasing um, uh, emphasis on physician assistants and nurse practitioners, which I think is a good thing. You know, and I, I mean, those people are um, becoming increasingly important in the delivery of healthcare, and you know, they really, in terms of the practical, um, you know, management of the new patient presenting with whatever and um, and the implementation of their therapy. These people are extremely good, you know, and they're and they're working very hard, and they're very high throughput, and they're learning rapidly. Um, I think when it comes to you know case complexities, the sorts of things that you need that probably greater depth of knowledge from medical school, you know, that's probably where the physicians are going to end up oh, okay. with a different yeah. role in relation to the whole thing. And I think what mm -hmm. traditionally has been a physician's uh, workload is increasingly going to be taken over by these mid-level mm -hmm. um, providers. It's interesting, I mean, it, it, you know, with my son going into medical yeah. school, I've sort of thought about, well, where's it going, how's it mm -hmm. changing, what's it going to be like, but you never really know. Yeah. I mean, I know that it's been a wonderful <laughs> career for me, you know, it's yeah. just a huge privilege to actually be a doctor. And you know, people come in and they, you know, they tell you their um, all their secrets, and they, um, you know, they trust themselves to you. And it is a huge privilege to be in that position. Mm -hmm. And you learn a lot from everyone you ever interact with. So it's, um, but also it's it's like never a dull moment. You know, yeah. it's everything's different all the time. Every you know, mm -hmm. you know, life is becomes a great you know, fun problem solving exercise. Yeah, with, crossword with, puzzle yeah. you're just yeah, saying. Yeah. yeah. So. Do you have a frustration with how people sometimes perceive how doctors operate in that sometimes people think they're impersonal because they can't spend as much time with the patient as they'd like? Do you think that the system sort of 
doesn't allow for that sort of interaction. Well, it does allow for it here at Mayo, yeah. which is one of the yeah. good things about Mayo. So, you know, your standard appointment time is half an hour for a return patient, an hour mm -hmm. for a new patient. And so, you know, Mayo, I think, really tries to emphasize that unhurried um, uh, encounter with the patient where the patient is going to really appreciate having had the time to ask mm -hmm. questions, you know, have concerns addressed. Inevitably, whatever you set the time at, it runs over. Yeah. You know, people <laughs> always pressure on that because of healthcare economics. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, see more patients short period of time, you know, you can charge the same amount of money and, you know, crank it up. And, um, and so that's a pressure. And um, at the same time, there's the pressure of documentation and, and that becoming more comprehensive, complete. Mm -hmm. So people are trying to fit more and more into a shorter and shorter period of time, and that is a frustration for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think it's easier for new people coming in to accept this is the way it is than for people who've been in the system for a long time who are now being asked to change their um, approach to practice. And okay. I think they find it very difficult. You know, if you're used to yeah. a half hour and now you've got 20 minutes or whatever. Yeah. That's, um, that's not an easy adjustment. Yeah. Or if you used to half an hour without, you know, um, too many forms to fill, and then suddenly you've got a whole <laughs> no, lot more, it's a problem. Yeah. So. Thank you very much for watching. I will have links to my podcast with Dr. Stephen J. Russell below, as well as links to the Conversationalist website and social media. Speak to you soon. Thank <laughs> you.